You know, there are a few moments in your life and in your career where you realize that this is, this is very special and, and a one-off. The moment I started talking to Count Durkheim, I realized how extraordinary this collection was. But then it is a complete survey of a generation of artists in its most concentrated form. 63 to 73, 10 years during which all the innovations happened. The Durkheim collection comprises 59 works by the most important German artists of that period, including Gerhard Richter, Sigmar Polke, Georg Baselitz, and Blinky Palermo. I was in a warehouse, uncreating picture after picture, and I became the first person outside the immediate family to see the collection of Count Christian Durkheim Ketelhaut. I remember you sent me an email, and you were saying, my hands are shaking. To be able to see so many works together, one after the other, and each one literally better than the next. It was an absolutely extraordinary experience. When you think about Baselitz, where we are in this room right now, you just told me that we have this amazing painting in the sale. We do. It's the Große Nacht. It's the sister piece to the most famous painting, which is in the Ludwig Museum in Cologne. And, and I mean, you and I both know the story of, of how this work was first exhibited. I remember that that exhibition was shut down by the police. Absolutely. It was the 1963 first show with um, Michael Werner and Benjamin Katz in Berlin. And Die Große Nacht im Eimer was shown. And it was actually the journalists at the time that ganged up against Baselitz and the show saying that it was obscene, that it was horrific, that it was shocking. And they started a rumor that the, that the exhibition had been shut down, which in fact then made the state prosecution come in. And then the police came in and confiscated the works. It's so interesting when you see these sort of very violent early pictures, but then you have something as amazing as that. This is Baselitz with his famous hero, the absolute beginning after the Second World War. He is from East Germany, came to the West to study, but in 1961 the wall came up, dividing and thereby divorcing him from his, from his home country. There is so much need to express of what is going on in Germany at the time, to have the sort of hero figure, which is in a way, this rather sort of pathetic man with his hands up, looking up for a new beginning. Strange enough, this is one of my favorites. This is 1963, Die Drei Herzen, The Three Hearts. The beauty lies in the colors, these fantastic rows and pinks and the reds. And then the subject matter is something that is supposed to be quite repulsive. And I love that because it pulls and pushes you. That's absolutely right. You know, it's very soft, very delicate coloring. And then, you know, you have these lumps of human flesh. You know, you have this, and then you have this amazing polka room, which I love the polarity of them both. So we are here in Dusseldorf. There is a marked difference between Berlin and Dusseldorf at the time. Pop art was much more visible in Dusseldorf than it was in Berlin, and you can, you can feel the direct influences on, on these artists from that time. This amazing polka, The Jungle, was last shown in 73, and there's only one surviving black and white illustration. We had no idea how big it was, and also, you know, the, the colorfulness of it and the scale of it, and there's never been a raster painting of this importance, of this size, of this beauty available on the open market. This is uh, 1964, Hemden. Sigma Polka had been born in 1941 in Silesia, which is now part of Poland. And then he arrived in Dusseldorf, and he was fascinated by this consumer culture. And so we have three shirts as kind of emblems of what it means to be in this petty bourgeois society. And even in 1964, even in West Germany, even in Dusseldorf, they were aspirational items. What I find so interesting is, in a way, this is a very drab painting. Two years later, he's a more successful artist. He is, it becomes confident, colorful, he looks towards New York, and it's a very different mood. This is fantastic. Palm Auf Autostoff of 1969. Cadillac, Rolls-Royce, Daimler. These are the sort of icons of ultimate consumerism, onto which he sort of superimposed his own emblem. He goes from a little blue shirt to Rolls-Royce and Daimler, so he's having more fun. Absolutely, yeah, and I think he's being more successful as well. So Michael, it's interesting to see you know, here he uses this fabric, like you say, mm. and it's a fancy fabric because it's about fancy cars, and he sews it together. And then you compare that with the Blinky Palermo, which is all about serene precision. 
Although they're using similar materials, the effect couldn't be more different. You're completely absorbed by this colour, which is remarkable considering it is just found fabric from a normal department store. This is from 1966, and this is the exact moment of the transition from when he's making painted canvases on wooden constructions into the Stoff build where he's using found fabric. It's very interesting to see them side by side. It's amazing to see this collection of works by Gerhard Richter. It's overwhelming to see this amount of pictures from that, that, that period of his life. And it's so concentrated as well. So when you think that this is literally one of the earliest paintings the artist ever made. I mean, what a surprise. I think um, this painting is only recorded in black and white. So actually to see this for the first time. And it shows the very, very beginnings of Gerhard Richter. It's an absolute rediscovery. Here he was about 32 years old, and then suddenly, you know, 1964, just a little bit older. I mean, he's already hitting a period of maturity and resolution in his work, which is extraordinary for someone of that age. Then, of course, Corsica, Fire Number no. 5, which is one of the first paintings literally based on a holiday snap by the right. artist. And, and I think, you know, water and fire are perhaps the most ephemeral, the most difficult things to actually paint, and yet the sense one has of this, this burning light, really reminds me of kind of near romantic painting from Germany, yeah. you know, of a much earlier period. And I'm overwhelmed also by the sense of um, what American art must have been saying to them at the time as well, because this is very much rooted in a choice of image and, and photography, and pop in a sense as well. Absolutely, it's a very German way of pop. It is much less about the consumer item, but more to do with fantasy, dreaming mm -hmm. of faraway holidays, and of course this blurring technique, which is you know at the heart of Richter's art, almost sort of stippled here with... Um, oh, it's remarkable how this different picture. this picture is. I mean, with the paintbrushes moving in different directions, and then at this amazing choice of subject matter, which is this kind of bourgeois, um, mystical kind of eroticism in a way, isn't yeah. it? And again, jumping from this picture to this other extraordinary portrait here, who clearly has a sort of facial similarity to Elvis Presley as well. Very much. And again, it's that sort of German take on, on pop art, on these influences, but very different to Warhol at the time. It kind of bowls you over that these pictures that you've known from reproduction only are suddenly here. Finally, this other great picture, which is the, the latest in, in, in the whole group from 1974. You know, a crucial moment in Richter's career. I think clearly the collector really thought about that. The sheer chutzpah of this picture in 1974, doing a picture like this, which is, you know, in many ways such a keystone for everything he's done since. But here we are right at the beginning, um, the latest of the pictures within this collection, but tantalizingly looking forward as to what he would achieve in color chart theories as well. And so incredibly rare. I mean, you know, you don't see works like this on the market. Count Durkheim collected Basel, it's Paul Gerichter in depth, but he also collected the entire generation. So you have wonderful works by Penck from 1965, by Konrad Luke that you never see, or by Eugen Schönebeck, where only 38 paintings survive of his entire oeuvre. The Durkheim collection of German art from the 60s and 70s is the definitive collection of German art. And I think the exhibition at Sotheby's will be the first time since 1985 when Norman Rosenthal curated German art of the 20th century at the Royal Academy. That German art of this caliber and then this cohesion will have been seen.